So is the microphone working okay? Yes. Good. So it's a pleasure to be here and I've become a Royals fan because I learned that if they didn't, they didn't sweep the games, I'd be competing with them and I wouldn't want to do that. So I'm, I'm really a Royals fan. I'm glad that they did what they did. Okay. Thank you. All right. So, yeah, so I want to talk about the project that I've been involved in in Panama for the past decade. And somebody asked me a few minutes ago, how did I first become interested in working in Panama? Um, I've been working mostly in South America, not so much in Central America for my career. I've done a lot of work collecting fossils in the Andes Mountains of Bolivia. But about 10 years ago, um, a friend of our museum um, went down to Panama and he, he asked if, he, if an entourage from my museum wanted to go with him. So we went down to Panama for a week and we were actually wined and dined by the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute, which is an installation, U.S. government installation in Panama. And it was really fascinating. The, the canal is, as you know, the canal is really fascinating. And we went around and the thing that's sort of the aha moment for me is I went up in this, this crane in Metropolitan Park in the city, in Panama City, and we were there with a plant physiologist, and he said, did you, and we saw all these experiments that were going on in, in, in this, this park, and we, see, we saw all the wildlife, and it was sort of this spectacular moment where I wanted to understand what it was like in the past in terms of the kind of biodiversity that existed in the rainforest millions of years ago. So I came back, to, um, came, back, came back home after a week and I, went, I got in touch with the curators at the Smithsonian that had a collection of fossils from Panama that had not been well understood and I started to work on those. So that's how I got interested in working in Panama. And Panama is fascinating because as geologists and paleontologists, we know that it's the gateway to the Americas, but, it, but it's only been the gateway to Americas for about the the past four million years. Geologists know that based on volcanic activity, the Isthmus of Panama five million years ago did not exist. It was a seaway and there was communication of, of communication and currents between the Caribbean and the Pacific Ocean. Okay, and we basically see that in terms of the fossil life that used to live on either side of the, of the, the Isthmus of Panama. And then what we see is based on geologic activity, about four million years ago, the Isthmus of Panama was created through volcanic, volcanic eruptions and the coalescing of, of the land masses. So we had a land bridge that formed that allowed animals from that evolved in South America to move northward, like you see the animals here. These are immigrants from the south. Conversely, animals from North America, like you see here, originated up here and migrated uh, uh, southward and were a they were able to cross the, the land bridge of Panama after the isthmus formed. That's a major event in Earth history and we call it the Great American Biotic Interchange. And as scientists or as a paleontologist, I'm very interested in the kinds of animals that went across the land bridge over the past couple of million years, but I'm equally interested in the kinds of animals that lived in Panama prior to the formation of the land bridge. So. The land bridge formed about four million years ago, the Isthmus of Panama, and, the, uh, and I'm interested in the kinds of animals that lived in the ancient rainforest 20 million years ago. And I'll talk more about why I'm specifically interested in that it relates to the age of the rocks that are exposed along the Panama Canal today. Let me say that we want to understand the ancient diversity of animals that lived in the tropics because those are areas of high biodiversity, high species richness. But it's really difficult to, f to collect fossils in, in the tropics for the following reason. I also collect fossils in, in the, the badlands of Nebraska, like you can see here. Okay? And it's easy to sort of walk along the surface of the land looking for, for, for fossils that are, crop, that are exposed, cropping out of, of, of the sediments. But imagine trying to collect fossils here. Okay, there are no outcrops. So although the tropics are very important for understanding the rich biodiversity that's evolved in the tropics, we don't know much about this area because they're not suitable places to find fossils. Okay? So that brings us to the, the Panama Canal. You know, you know that the Panama Canal, we're celebrating the centennial, and you know that the, 
the Panama Canal was, was finally finished in 1914 and that it was a, a really a spectacular civil engineering feat and you know about the, the, lo the formation of the locks, etc. And this is a picture of the Panama Canal and this is something called the Centenario Bridge that has been built over the Panama Canal over the past 10 years. When they started excavating the, the, the pilings for the, for the Centenario Bridge, we started collecting fossils along the area and found some, some, we made some new discoveries of the kinds of animals that used to live in Panama 19 to 20 million years ago. But what's happened over the past 10 years has revolutionized our understanding of, or our ability to collect fossils in Panama because, as we know, right now the Republic of Panama is undergoing a major expansion of the Panama Canal on a scale that has not been seen for, for 100 years. And what's really cool about the expansion is that they're digging through, they're, this is a centenario bridge in the low, so the, the lower, the southern series of locks, the Pira, Pedro Miguel and Miraflores locks are down to the south there. This is the centenario bridge. Looking from the other direction, that photograph was taken in this direction. Looking from this direction, looking northward, we find these excavations. As a result of what they're doing is they're, they're bypassing they're building a new branch of the, of, the, of the Panama Canal in the south and north to bypass the old locks. You know the story because the, the, ship, the locks are too small to accommodate the large ocean-going cargo vessels that are, that are, that are uh, found today. Okay? So when they're digging through those, those deposits, these are, these, are fossil depo these are highly fossiliferous sediments that preserve the, the ancient life that existed in, the, existed in what's now Panama 19 to 20 million years ago. So that provides what we're calling a once in a century opportunity to advance scientific knowledge and discovery about the kinds of animals that used to live in what's now Panama. This is just another view and then what we do, so this is, a, this is where we're collecting some of our fossils. Again, Centenario Bridge. This is a Google Earth image. This is the Centenario Bridge and what we do now is we precisely plot all of the fossil localities. This is the one locality here. Um, that we've, we've excavated fossils from, and we've, we have one from right, right underneath the Centenario Bridge, and then some other important fossil localities straddling the Panama Canal, as you can see here. Every one of our fossils is precisely located using uh, GPSs. It's, it's just the way we do paleontology these days. Okay, this is a geologic map of, of the Panama Canal, and the different, color, um, different colors represent different age rocks that we see on the surface uh, of the Earth. And what we're, the, the major work that we're doing relates to exactly where they're digging new parts of the canal, the, the, the bypasses for the canal. In the Gatun Locks area, in the northern part of the canal, they're digging a bypass and we're collecting fossils in these marine sediments that are about 10 million years old and I'll talk about those later. But I primarily want to focus on the kinds of animals that we're collecting because most of our work is being focused on the southeastern part of the Panama Canal along the Gaylord Cut and these animals lived about 19 to 20 million years ago. So when we saw the opportunity for, um, to exploit this once in a century excavations, we proposed uh, a project to the National Science Foundation. So your taxpayer's money is paying for this project and there's a program uh, called the Partnerships in International Research and Education. And these are um, uh, uh, comprehensive proposed projects that are not just about, about research, but they're also about international experiences, about education and outreach to the, to the general public. So I'm going to describe briefly about what the PIRE project is. And the PCP stands for the Panama Canal Project. And it has four components, partnerships, international research, and education and outreach. It's a large partnership that's been developed uh, over the past five years by our team uh, using, uh, with, with partners or stakeholders from institutions in the United States, school districts, universities, museums, the Smithsonian, Florida State University, as well as institutions and funders in both Panama and Colombia, as you can see here. Our primary funder from the, the Panama is Senesit, which is the um, National Secretary of, of Science and Technology. We have permission to work in the canal from the, uh, the Panama Canal Authority. You can't just go in the canal and collect fossils. 
It's a high security area. You have to have clearance, so we've been fortunate uh, that the Autoridad, the ACP, has allowed us to work in, in, in Panama. Then we have university connections. We have connections with a fabulous new museum that just opened in, in Panama called the Bio Museo. And I'll show you some pictures of that. So this is a story or a, a project that relates to, relates about science, but also about a benefit of society and training the next generation of scientists for public good. The first thing we did is we had to develop an internship program because if you wait too long and if you, I go down to Panama about, I spend 30 to 45 days a year in Panama. I go down four to six times a year, usually for about a week or so at a time. But that's not good enough. If you need to collect fossils along the canal, you need to be there every day, basically Monday through Friday. Because as they're doing the excavations, you need teams of scientists working behind the excavators to collect the fossils that are uh, uncovered. Otherwise, they just, they just erode away. So we developed what's called a, boot, a Boots on the Ground, an international internship program. And uh, students who are taking a semester off from college or want something to do during the summers or are between the, the bachelor and the master's degree, they spend three months in Panama. They get an authentic experience of what it's like to collect uh, fossils and do research along the canal and they're able to put that on their resumes. They learn about geology, paleontology, and biodiversity. The Spanish immersion is really important. In today's society, it's important that scientists are multicultural, certainly bilingual, and have international experiences in the global scientific enterprise. We provide the housing a monthly a stipend, and so far we've had over 30 interns from a variety of universities, both not just in, not just in the United States, but also from uh, University of Bristol in the UK, as well as from um, the large university in Bogota, the Uniandes. So it's an international team of, of students that are representing the next generation of science in, in, in the United States by working in Panama. And here's a picture of our first cohort of interns, and they're actually living where we've rented a house, and this is an old canal. You probably see pictures of that in your, your exhibits. This is an old, it was built during the, uh, in the canal zone, okay? And we've rented one of these for the students to, to live and work out of. So over the past five years, we've spent more than 6,000 person field days in Panama making major discoveries advancing our knowledge of, anim of the animal and plant life that used to live in the ancient tropics. So this is an example of one of our cohorts from one of our initial cohorts. And here they are, the four interns. And that's the Panama Canal right there. They're just north of the Centenario Bridge. And they're digging fossils. These are 19 to 20 million year old sediments cropping out Right on, the, right on the shores of the Panama Canal. And what they're finding are fossils like in this block here. They, from here, this group, found this block of fossils. And what you see here is a shoulder blade or a scapula of, a, of, a, of an extinct rhinoceros that used to live in Panama 19 million years ago. Likewise, they found this spectacular jaw, a very, very rare animal called a bear dog that no longer exists today. It's an extinct family of mammals. And this is its lower jaw. You see its large canine. This is the front of the jaw. And these are its, its shearing teeth in that, in, in, um, in that bear dog. So that's the way the, way the fossils look like when they're, they're coming out of the field. We take them out in blocks and we do some initial preparation at the Smithsonian. And then we send them to, to researchers on loan to work on. These are the patrimony of the, of the country. They will ultimately go back to Panama. All right, so we ha uh, the National Science Foundation funds research discoveries. So we had to have a strong research component, asking some questions if that would make sense in terms of the dis discoveries we could make along the Panama Canal. So the kinds of questions that we were asking are, what kind of, what kind of animals, and my particular interest is in mammals, so what kind of animals and plants lived in Panama 90 million, million years ago during what's called the Miocene before the formation of the land bridge? Remember the land bridge and the Great American Biotic Interchange occurred about 4 million years ago and we're talking about animals and plants that lived there 15 million years before the formation of the isthmus. Were the animals then more, they were closer to South America at this time, but were the animals more similar to animals that were evolving in South America at that time or in North America? We didn't know, but we've, we've answered that question. 
Did the tropical rainforest exist? There are theories about whether the rainforest is ephemeral and it comes and goes with fluctuations in climate, or has the rainforest been a stable uh, habitat with, with species diversification over millions of years? And then, from a societal uh, point of view, why should we care about all this? Okay? So those are the kinds of things that, we seek, that we've, um, we've tried to answer as part of this PCP Pyre project. This is what it's like to collect um, fossils along the canal, but just imagine that if we turn the, uh, the, if we turn the humidifier on here to 105%, no, 100% humidity, and it's 96 degrees, it's like the worst day in July or August, okay, here, it's, it's, it's awful. And somebody asked how to, frankly, I'm too old to work out there all day. Uh, what I do is when I go there, I get, get out really early in the morning, about 6, and I work till about noon or 1 o'clock, and then I'm finished. It's, it's, it really is brutal, and it's only for the young, mostly for the young of heart, um, who, who are working there, and they, they get used to it. Plus, they also come in about 1 or 2 in the afternoon, and then they work in the air-conditioned lab. It is really terrible. And I was talking to somebody, I think, at lunch. I can't imagine how, labor, how people who built the canal 100 years ago could work out 8 or 10 hours a day. It's just exhausting. It really is. So what we do is we, we don't have any high-tech methods to find fossils. You just have to go and you have to prospect for them. You, you, you can spend hours and hours and hours. These are the new, this is the canal and this is one of the new benches for the uh, terraces for the canals. And this is a fresh exposure. A year later, that's entirely covered over with grass. Okay? That's how fast the vegetation re, um, recycles in Panama. So we, we look at the fresh exposures looking for fossils on the ground. Once we find them, we, we, we hunker down and we quarry them. Like you see here, that's the picture I just showed you where they found the bear dog and the rhinoceros. My student Julie actually found a megalodon, a shark's tooth from this area. She spent her entire day, six or seven hours in the blazing sun, and she found one tooth, okay? So you really have to have patience. It's not easy, okay? And then these students here, these are Panama, students from the University of Panama and from the University of Florida working a quarry that has a spectacular new discovery that sort of changes our understanding of the, land, of, the, of the origins of the land bridge, but I'll talk about that in a few minutes. The other thing we do is sometimes there are tiny fossils that you can't see with the, as you're walking along the surface, and if you, if you bag up the, major, the sand and wash it through a screen, you then, like they're doing here and like my, my colleague Gary Morgan's doing, what we then do is we take the, the sand matrix, the residue, from the screens and we bring them back in the laboratory and the students pick grain by grain looking for tiny, tiny rodent teeth or bat teeth and that's what's called uh, microfaunal screen washing. So there are two methods in, way in which we do paleontology in which in fact that's all paleontologists do. You do prospecting or you do screen washing and we employ both methods in Panama and what that does is um, if you do both, then you're going to increase the diversity of what you find because some of the smaller things you won't find as you're walking along the surface of the ground, you'll find through the screen washing technique. Then what will happen is, so one of my graduate students was down there and he sent me an, an, a photograph of an image. So thank goodness for the internet and for email because in the morning they can find a fossil, in the afternoon they can send it to me to identify. So this was about four years ago. This is maybe to you, it looks like just a, a piece of rock. But to me, it has this, these are some teeth that are sticking out of that conglomerate. Okay? And I said, that may be a fossil horse that's really interesting. Okay? Because most people think that horses originated in North America when they were introduced by the Spanish some 500 years ago. But research has shown that horses are actually lived in, in the Americas for the past 53, 55 million years, okay? And here we have the evidence of a horse that lived in Panama 19 million years ago. Um, this is a horse because when we prepared it out back in our laboratory, this, so these teeth right here are the same as those teeth right there, okay? Just we prepared away the matri the surrounding sediment. And once we, the teeth are highly diagnostic in terms of what that anim, who that animal was. And we know that that animal, when we find it anywhere else in the world, we found that this is a three-toed extinct horse about the size of a donkey that lived throughout North America and into the old world, into Eurasia, and it even got into Africa 
about 20 to 19 million years ago. And every time we find it anywhere else in the world, it's found in, in far ancient forested ecosystems. So it's an indicator species for ancient forests, and we find it in Panama. We've also studied the chemistry of its teeth, which is a whole other interesting story, which is part of my research. And based on looking at the carbon chemistry of the teeth, we can, we can know whether this animal was feeding on leaves in a tropical forest or feeding on grass. And the results of my work indicate that this animal was feeding on leaves in a tropical forest. Based on the carbon, the carbon isotope contents, content of the teeth that uh, preserves what it ate when those teeth were forming 19 or 20 million years ago, when, this, when that animal was alive. Okay. How do we know the age of the fossils is a question that is frequently asked. Many of our fossils come from these. These are ancient soils. These different, these different color horizons here are ancient soils. There's a little fault right here. Doesn't really matter. This is Centenario Bridge. And what we have a locality right underneath the Centenario Bridge. And what we know is that there, uh, about, there, there's a, th this whole part is a volcanic ash fl flow that spewed out of a volca volcano and then solidified. And we know based on techniques similar to carbon-14 dating but using other elements that that, that volcanic eruption solidified 18.9 million years ago. So that constrains the age that fossils in this area right here are, are younger than 18.9 million years. And if we find fossils in soils down here, they're slightly older. And based on, the reverse, or based on an understanding of the reversals of the Earth's magnetic field, we know that, that this whole package of sediments is about 18.9 million years old, plus or minus a couple hundred thousand years each way. So basically, if I say that the fossils are about 19 million years old, that's, that's, pretty, that's good enough. Okay? And we know that based, not based on the fossils themselves, but based on their association in the rocks with volcanic eruptions that are these, these um, chronometer, these, these basically geologic clocks. So these are the kinds, this is, this is the results of our work, the 6,000 person field days that we've, we've spent in Panama. And what we're finding is that um, the denizens of the ancient rainforests from Panama include animals that both have descendants today that live in the tropics, but also other animals that lived in the tropics 19 million years ago, but no longer live there. Okay, so we find, we find the origins of the modern bats, um, um, pocket gophers that are found in North America, flying squirrels that are also found throughout Asia, Okay, then I mentioned bear dogs. So this is a bear dog. This was um, that, that jaw that I showed you. This is what that animal looked like. Bear dogs are otherwise known from North America. Wolves and dogs, the origins. We have the early origins of, of the canid family, wolves and dogs, also of North America. An animal related to raccoons called the kinkajou. Again, from North America. Okay. Um, Oreodonts are, an animal, are, are, are very common in the badlands of Nebraska. We find oreodonts that are the same as we find in Nebraska 19 to 20 million years ago in Panama. Okay? This is a giant pig-like animal that we, was also found in, in Eurasia and came across the Bering Land Bridge about 23 million years ago. We find it throughout North America. We see it in Panama. Okay? Then this weird sort of deer-like animal, elk-like animal that had this big slingshot horn on it. Okay? And then the origins of modern peccaries. We find ancient ancestors of peccaries. Interesting, we find camels. Okay? Find camels in Panama. And then we find horses. This is the Ancotherium, the forest-dwelling horse, and rhinoceroses. Okay? So where did these animals originate? One of the questions that we wanted to answer was, did, did, the animals ha, did the animals that we find in Panama have affinities from the, the northern hemisphere? Or do they, they, they come across from South America? And what have I, what have I been saying so far? North. North America. Okay, so all the animals that we see here so far were north of the, or there were, were north of the isthmus before it existed. And those animals migrated throughout North America into Panama during that time. And then some of those animals went into the old world, like the rhinoceroses and the horses, and they became extinct in Panama. That's why we don't find rhinoceroses in the rainforest today. But they existed millions of years ago in the rainforests of the tropic, uh, New World tropics. 
We also find crocodilians and caimans and interesting boaed snakes and other, and other uh, vertebrates, the, the turtles that you can see here. And we had a graduate student who just finished his dissertation on the kinds of fossil plants that we find in, in, in Panama and what you can tell about the climate based on the plants, which also are indicator species. So where do you find avocados, palms, mangoes, custard apples today? tropical areas. The plants that we find along the Panama Canal uh, consists of families that otherwise are known from tropical warmer climes of today, indicating something about the, the ancient climate back 19 million years ago. And in fact, there's been some classic work in paleontology on the shape of leaves. And when you have very large leaves that don't have teeth on them, that those tend to be, be found in, in, in rainforested environments. So we look at the, not just the kinds of, kinds of plants that are, were, were found, but also the shapes of the fossil leaves. Tell us that these animals, that, excuse me, that these plants lived in rainforests or indicate rainforests. So if you said, what is, what is a reconstruction of what life was like in Panama 19 million years ago? It was something like this. This is right during a, a thunderstorm. Okay, the lighting, the contrast is, uh, is, it's hard for me to see from here, but basically we're, we have the animals that are, the rhinoceros, the horse, the bear dog, the animals that I showed you two, a couple slides ago are all put together in a group photo shot right here, which is a mural of what life was like in the ancient rainforest 19 million years ago based on the discoveries we've made along, of fossils along the Panama Canal. So we've answered the question, so why is it like this? Why, during the, why in the Americas during 19 million years ago are all the fossils that we find, do they have affinities with, group, with other fossils of similar age in North America? In, and this is a reconstruction of the animals that lived in North America during this time. Why are we finding no sloths? Th that animal is called a toxodont, which is an animal that evolved in South America, as did monkeys, the platyrrhine monkeys in South America. We're not finding these animals in Panama during the Miocene. We're only finding animals that were from North America. So that confirms the geologic evidence that there was a, there was a barrier, there was no isthmus here, and that animals that were evolving in, in South America during the Miocene 19 million years ago didn't get to Panama. And all the animals that we find are from North America. So that answers one of the questions that we were trying to pose. Maybe. I'll tell you something. Science, science is, never perf is never clean. Um, if I were giving you, the, if, if I were presenting this talk two years ago, I'd say that's the story. It's nice and tidy. There are no exceptions to the rule. Well, um, about a year and a half ago, these, this, the interns were doing some of this screen washing and they found these tiny, these teeth are, are just tiny, tiny teeth, okay? And these teeth represent, and th this is from the sediments in the Panama Canal. These are a little older, it doesn't really matter, they're 20 million years old, but really for our purposes it doesn't matter. But these teeth represent a monkey. Oop, I heard that. <laughs> And the reason that's really cool and also really perplexing is it's the exception to the rule. Monkeys, we know, based on lots of geologic and paleontological evidence, of New World monkeys evolved in South America. They never got up into the outside of the tropics, okay? But they did get in the tropics. We have howler monkeys and other kinds of monkeys in the tropics today. So we now have an exception to the rule. How do you explain? There's an, the exception of the rule is that in Panama, 19 or 20 million years ago, we're getting monkeys. So that's a real problem. Because if there's no other evidence of animals that got across during this time, how did the monkeys get across? And I'm going to be, hmm? Swimmers. Swimmers. We're not sure. <laughs> whether they rafted or whether they were good swimmers. We don't know the answer to that yet, okay? But the nice thing about science is that science is not necessarily tidy. It gets more interesting. So then we're now thinking about how might they have gotten over that barrier, that overwater uh, barrier to dispersal because they're the exception to the rule and that's what we're working on right now. Okay, 
So in addition, I said that we were looking at some of the fossils in the northern part, um, near the Gatun in the northern part uh, of the canal. And um, the cool thing about these animals is they're about 9 or 10 million years younger. And they represent the kinds of animals that lived in the seaway, where the isthmus exists now but didn't exist 10 million years ago. They're evidence of marine life. So this is my PhD student, Catalina, and she studies the evolution of size of these humongous sharks called megalodon. Okay, that's, that's a real shark tooth. Uh, that's, I don't know, that, that's, not, that's not a sort of a, a gigantic fake. Here's a reconstruction of, of a megalodon jaw. Similar, it's, in, it's distantly related to the modern great white shark, but it was the size of a whale. 60 to, 60 to 70 feet long that we know live throughout the world about 15 to, 5 million, 15 to 2 million years ago, and we find evidence of that, th those, that megalodon shark in Panama. So I have students working both on, in the land an, on the, with the land animals as well as some of the marine animals. And then um, uh, Carlos de Gracia is a Panamanian student, and he's studying the evolution of marlins, and the most spectacular marlin in the entire, fossil in the entire world. This is seven feet long. Okay, that's almost, uh, maybe it's a little larger than real size, but that's, it's, a hu it's a humongous slab of a fossil from the Chagres north of, north, uh, near, the, near, near the Gatun locks. You can see this is the, the, the head, its vertebral column, and its large tail. It's what's called the, the, the caudal fin. So he's studying the evolution of marlins based on spectacular discoveries that he's making. These are the fossils you know, along the beach in the northern part in the Caribbean side of the, of the Panama Canal, of the, the, yeah, along the northern side of the Panama Canal. So in terms of wrapping up, remember I asked, we asked some questions and my question is now how have we done in terms of answering the questions that we initially asked or proposed to the National Science Foundation? We've discovered a unique biodiversity previously unknown in the ancient New World tropics. We've documented that there was high biodiversity we provided evidence for northern affinities of these animals, despite the proximity of South America, with the exception of the monkey. Thank you, thank you. We've demonstrated that a tropical rainforest, based on the plants and the, the indicator species like the horse, that the rainforest existed during the Miocene 19 million years ago. We've also documented the evidence for the kinds of animals that lived offshore um, back about 10 million years ago. All right. So the last part of this, pretty much on time, um, is Pyre, the last thing is education and outreach, and that really is my passion now, as you'll see in the next couple of minutes. So uh, I'm a museum scientist, and I'm fascinated, I, I like to work with, partner with other museums, particularly natural history museums. So we're partnering with this spectacular new museum that just opened in Panama called the Bio, the Bio Museum, or the Bio Museo. It's dedicated to, the, to understanding the biodiversity of the tropics, past, present, and perhaps future. And this was designed by the, famous, the world famous architect Frank Geary. Okay, and it's a typical Frank Geary building. Um, and you might, it, it's, it, it's gonna be a, spec, it is a spectacular architectural icon along the Amador in, in the southern part of, in, in along, um, just as you approach the southern part of the Panama Canal, it's really a spectacular museum. All right, so here we are going into the museum for a sneak, a sneak preview. And the Panama, the Beale Muse Museo doesn't have any collections. So what we did is we partnered with them and my, my graduate students and technicians took specimens for, of, from Florida of our collections that represent the kinds of animals that went across the isthmus. And we made, perf we made replicas of those fossils and we put them on, we, we, we sent them to the Panama Canal Muse uh, to the Bio Museum. So here you can see some of the specimens, for example, that's a, limb, a leg of a horse. Okay, that's a saber-toothed uh, tiger, skull and jaws. And you can see that, and this is the new exhibit at the Bio Museum that just opened. Okay, and then Chinika is holding her fossil rhinoceros jaw. These are all the 19 million year old fossils, okay? And we put these, hmm? What's the bird for? Um, that's an, a large animal called Titanus, a flightless bird. Cool. Yeah, cool. And anyway, you can see that that, that that is now on display. This is on display and this is on display in this, this case, 
this vitrine, as they call it, at the Bio Museo. So we're contributing back to understanding the knowledge about the great American biotic interchange and the ancient biodiversity through making um, replicas of specimens in our collections. Okay? And I feel like we have to, to do a really good partnership, there has to be sort of um, what we call bilateral exchange of information and resources. All right. Here I am with teachers back two summers ago in front of, uh, this is a spectacular exhibit about the, these are sculptures of the kind of animals that went across the bridge after four million years ago. Okay, and then most of the other people here are science teachers from, from California, from the Navajo Reservation of New Mexico, and from Florida. All right, so I'm really interested in, in taking science to the public, particularly through museums as well as school through both teachers and students. So when we go to Panama, uh, I encourage my postdocs and myself. Uh, we, we work with students. Here we are. Uh, Dr. Austin Handy is one of my postdocs. And we're collecting fossils. Every one of these white specks that you see are 10 million year old fossil shells from something called the Gatun Formation. And, and they also, we, that's where we find the big shark's teeth as well. And the students were let loose trying to find fossils and understand what paleontology and fossils are about in their country. Okay. These are the teachers collecting fossils. Well, these are teachers from California. And the reason I work with California teachers is because their superintendent of schools, Gary Bloom, is crazy for fossils. And he went down and volunteered at the Smithsonian three years ago and, uh, in the paleontology laboratory there and said he had such a good experience. He wanted his teachers to also have the same experience. So he and I have gotten together and written several additional uh, grants to involve science teachers in international experiences, much the, way, much the same way we're involving um, students. And that's been really rewarding. So here, and then in the evenings back at the hotel, here are the science teachers and every night we have a, we have a session about what they learn and they're, here they're actually developing a lesson plan to take to the kids the next day back in that Gatun where they were collecting the marine fossils. And here we are with the, with the teachers from that cohort. Okay, there's Gary, the superintendent, with teachers from another school, excuse me, with students from another school and some of their teachers. And here are the, here are the students who were actually studying the orientation of the shells in the ancient, in the ancient uh, tidal currents, and they're using uh, what's called the Brunton compass, a geology's compass, a uh, geologist's compass to, to learn how to study the orientation of the shells, what we call hydraulic orientation, preferred orientation. They're learning this right in the field. These are fourth graders. Okay, Re these little girls were in the heat for two hours doing this and it didn't phase them. This was, this was a, for me, an inspirational moment as a professor seeing people, kids getting turned on to science like this. Okay. Here's another one. Okay, we, we, we have these, these brochures that we've, we have developed through digital resources and those brochures are laminated and we give them to the kids and we, we say go out and, and find fossils and identify them. Figure out what they are and how they might relate to the kinds of fossils you would find on the, excuse me, the kinds of shells that you'd find on the beach today. So that's what they're doing here. You think they're having fun? Yes. Okay. You think that's fun to watch if you're a professor? Absolutely. Okay. About two years ago, I was asked to give a talk to the Panama Canal Society, which is a bunch of Zonians. Does anybody want to know what a Zonian is? What's a Zonian? Born and raised in the, in the canal zone. So no, zone, Zonians no longer are born, being born because there's no longer a canal zone. Okay, so this is definitely, this is an, aged, this is an aging um, group. So they, they, they asked me, the Panama Canal Society is a group of Zonians. And they said, would you come and give a talk about, about your Panama Canal project? So, uh, okay, so I did. So I went to Orlando, I hate Orlando. Oh, that's another story. Um, <laughs> and you don't want, anyway. Um, so I gave this talk, and they were really, they were really interested. It was a great group, about 50 or 60 people, and they were really interested, and they were invested in it because a lot of them had grown up in Panama, and they were excited to see the kinds of things that were coming out of the new canal. So they, 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 really, they, were, a good, they were a good crowd. So this guy comes up, comes up afterward, John Turner, who's the guy on the right, and he says, when I was a Boy Scout in 1959, I, was, I, was, uh, coll I collected fossils along, the, along what's called Lake Madden which is one of the reservoirs that feed, feed the canal. 
and I found some big triangular shark's teeth. I said, yeah, that's easy. That's, that's megalodon. Those are a dime a dozen. That's, that's fine. That, that's expected. He goes, but I also found a mastodon tooth. I said, that's impossible. It, it, it couldn't have happened. He goes, I'm going to send it to you. Okay? So this is what he sent to me. And this is indeed a mastodon tooth that's 15 million years old. Before the land bridge, these mastodons came down from North America. And we, this is the first evidence of mastodons in Panama, or entire central, uh, the southern part of Central America. And if I hadn't given this talk to this guy, and if he didn't send me a picture of this that was in his garage since 1959, <laughs> I wouldn't have known about it. So we become new best friends, and we, we communicate by email all the time, and he keeps sending me fossils from, from boxes in his garage, and, and they're, they're incredible things. So anyway, I published, this actually turns out to be this animal called Gomphotherium, which is found throughout North America 15 million years ago, and actually also found in the old world. So think about the serendipity of this. If I hadn't been invited to give a talk, if I hadn't given that talk, if he hadn't been there, I mean, just imagine. So this is just by this circumstance of me giving this talk, it's advanced our understanding of an animal that we had no knowledge had lived in Panama had he not collected this. So he described where this was in the Boy It's called the Madden Boy Scout Camp, which no longer exists. It's now part of the Chagres National Park. And he, from his descriptions, he, we went back and we actually relocated more or less uh, he said he collected along the shores. He went from the camp on a, a sendero on a trail, and, and right along the shores he collected the, the mastodon tooth, this gomphothir. So we relocated the more or less the approximate uh, place that he found in 1959, the tooth, and we did this in January 2014. Okay, and I've since been back. Here I am with some of the teachers, and I, I'm going to tell you that. Riding in a dugout, a motorized dugout canoe, which goes like this a lot, is, is a scary thought, but they were good. They were good. These are, my, these are the teachers who were with me, and we went to an island to collect fossils, and this is what they found in this island is animals, turtle. We didn't find any more gonfotheries on this trip, but, but in July we found megalodon teeth. Okay, so, so Dr. Turner has turned me on to a whole new window of understanding of the kinds of animals that lived in Panama. 15 million years ago based on fossils that he had collected as a Boy Scout in 1959. I think that's really cool. Okay. All right. Okay, so I'm finishing here. Um, and right about on time. So I love this quote as a paleontologist um, from Eugene O'Neill. There is no present or future, only the past happening over and over again now. So it justifies me being a paleontologist and studying the past. But when I give this talk to like Rotary Clubs and stuff, they say, that's not good enough, Bruce. That's sort of academic speak. That, that, that doesn't help me very much, okay? So what I think really hits home and what I get a sense resonates with, with folks when I give this talk is, I think by engaging the next generation, we're making a major impact, okay? Uh, we're making a major impact with students that are already committed to being paleontologists. As you can see in the left, the, the interns that work with us. But who knows how we might have inspired one of the students who we've worked with in the field from Panama, okay, who may never, may never have even, most of the kids, I was told by their teachers that mo, uh, on this one trip with these girls, these middle school girls, that they had never been out in the field before. And some of them were so excited the night before they couldn't go to sleep. That's what their mothers had told the teachers. And then they got out there and for two or two and a half hours their attention span was just incredible. And to think that we might, that the project might inspire some of those kids to get turned on to science, whether they become a paleontologist really is not that important. But maybe there's something about that that, that got them really interested in, in science and to me, these are some of the impacts, the lasting impacts, that albeit are hard to quantify, but those are the kinds that I really think are important in these large projects. So with that, I'll end and say thank you for your attention. It's been a pleasure. And we have time for questions. Raise your hand. I'll come by with the microphone. We want to get 
you on the mic for our live stream audience and our videotape. Just as a reminder, hold the microphone close to your mouth. Otherwise, Hi, what's, what's the distance that was the water and is now the land bridge? 150 miles. 250 kilometers, it was significant, it wasn't a small barrier. And the currents, maybe the currents helped, we're not really sure. That'd be a long swim. Yeah. Got a question back here? Hold on. Yeah, um, I was wondering, is the internship program still open and can I apply without university affiliation? Yes. So what you need to do is um, go to our website right there and you can apply through there. It's, it's, it's become fairly competitive during the summers, less so if you were able to work like during semesters because, they're, because a lot of students are going to class, but in the summer they're looking for something to do. So by all means you, you should apply and you should look, there's an, a deadline coming up, so go ahead and check fairly soon. Is there uh, a reason why you're pretty low tech on your, your paleontology? Because there's no high tech method that's any better than, there's no substitution for looking at, at fossils. People have tried remote sensing and it doesn't work. Not, in, this, in this situation, it doesn't work. There, there's, no way to, there's no way to, you could actually, people are starting to use drones but, to look for dinosaurs. But for us, you just have to basically get out there. There, there is no high tech way of finding the fossils. I am joining you in your perplexity about North American and then the monkeys showing up. And a question that I have, if, if the isthmus was formed through volcanic action, does that happen gradually? So all of a sudden, first there's water and then boom, the volcano and then land? Or is it a gradual thing so that there could be trees that are yes. growing out of it so monkeys could travel over trees? And then what's the inclination for, or the, I guess the, um, inspiration to move in terms of their own habitats. Thank you. That's, there are several interesting questions there. Um, probably when the, well not probably, when the monkeys got from South America into pa what's now Panama, we know based on the paleogeography, based on the, the ancient geography that there weren't gradual accumulation, it, it, there was a seaway, there was definitely a large barrier on the order of perhaps 250, 150 miles, 200 miles. It was, it was a significant barrier. Okay, that was the answer to your first, the comment on your first question. Your second question was? Volcano. Yeah, so not, there were not catastrophic volcanic eruptions. It probably was a gradual accumulation of individual volcanic eruptions that coalesced adjacent islands that were volcanic. And there could have been Closer to four or five million years ago, there could have been a series of islands that would have bridged the ancient seaway. But back 20 million years ago, so far as we know, there was not volcanic activity that far back. Let me get here and I'll be over there, sir, after this. Um, your, map that sh your map that showed the uh, bridge across the, across the canal showed about four or five different sites that you had found fossils and you said that they were, were rich. Was there some particular uh, geographic thing that would have brought animals to those locations or was that just a random, random place where animals died? It's just it's just a random place where they died and also they've been fossilized and, and were able to uncover them. If you would go five miles on either side, if they were to do excavations, and if, we were, if they were to go through, if they were to excavate through the same age sediments, we would predict that we would find those fossils there also. There was nothing about, um, there was no concentration that we knew of, as a res that we know of. It's basically just a happenstance of the opportunity that we have from the, as a result of the excavations. Thank you. Understanding this is all about Panama, et cetera. Where else in the world 
is this type of work being done, uh, uh, studying uh, fossils and uh, wherever it might be to see what animals might have existed uh, like, like 20, year, 20 million years ago? So basically all over the world, uh, people are looking at, paleontologists are looking at 20 million year old fossils in Australia throughout Eurasia, in Africa, to understand human, the sort of the, the context or framework of human origins, although it's much older, 20 million years, okay? And then throughout the Americas and into Europe. So all over the world where there are fossil deposits, people are, this is an interesting time in Earth history because it's a time when we have the, the origins of many of the modern groups of animals that we see today on land uh, and in the oceans also. Couple of hands up back there. Let me get a question up here first, and I'll be back. You find any evidence of humans there? No, we don't. There, the humans came throughout the Americas probably 12 to 15,000 years ago, maybe a little older, depending upon what you believe. I'm not an archaeologist, um, so we're looking at, at we're looking at deposits that are 19 to 20 million years old. So they're way, way, way too old to have any evidence of humans, and we don't find any evidence of humans. Dr. McFadden, this being Zinc's night where Cornelians around the world are gathering together, I'm moved to ask, did your own interest in this come when you were at Cornell at Columbia or when you were a Boy Scout 50 years ago? So that's an interesting question. Um, when I was a little kid, um, my, I, I grew up in outside New York City in Mount Vernon, New York, and my mom was a single mom in the 50s, and she'd say, would you want to go in to see a Yankees game or go to the American Museum of Natural History? And I always opted to go to the American Museum of Natural History, so I, had a, I was one of those childhood child, child, children that had a, ch a fascination with dinosaurs. And then I sort of drifted off for a while, and then I was a pre-med at Cornell, and um, a pre-med student, and I didn't really, you know, I guess that's what I thought I was going to be doing, but it wasn't really, and then I took a class in paleontology, it was called the uh, Historical Geology or the History of Life, taught by a, a professor whose name was John Wells, very famous professor, a member of the National Academy, and um, he inspired me to go on to, to work, I thought it, this is what I want to do. So to answer your question, that's how I got involved in, in doing paleontology. And I went, on, went to graduate school to work uh, on fossil sharks, but that didn't work out. So then I studied um, geophysics and looking at how we study reversals of the Earth's magnetic field to determine the age of fossils. So that's what I did my dissertation on. That's how I got interested in what I'm doing. How I got interested in, in the science and outreach was I was a museum director for seven years. And I realized that there was more to, that I thought that communicating science to the public was really important. And seeing little kids in exhibits getting turned on uh, is just as interesting for me as making a, a discovery of a new kind of species of something that existed millions of years ago. It's just my own, the way I feel. So I'm, I'm excited to do both in terms of my career. There was a hand up. I lost track of it. Here you go. Um, I also find compelling the inspiration for the next generation of students. At the same time, we recognize that the funds for scaling those kinds of experiences, uh, I'm just going to suggest if I were a politician making budget decisions and you're saying spending this money and allowing us to have the STEM outreach for the young interns and the school's children is why we should care about this kind of investigation. I totally agree with you, but I also then want to know how are you translating those kinds of field <coughs> experiences into museums and other kind of genuine, genuine simulations yeah, so we're trying to scale. So do you see what I'm saying? Is I do. That, how do we move this to where it's not 30 children, but 30,000 children having an authentic experience like this? So every, every teacher that goes to Panama with me is expected to write lesson plans and to implement those lesson plans. And six months after they go to Panama, 
We meet again, all of us, I'll be meeting with them in Albuquerque in December, and we review what they've done and how that's impacted their, both their teaching and what the studies that we've, what the evaluation that we've done so far indicates is not just the translation of the knowledge, but it's also sort of the rejuvenation and the transformation of the teaching and how, and how they want to teach in a different way and their new standards that, for those of you that are teachers, know that are being implemented nationally called the NGSS, the Next Generation Science Standards. And a lot of what they learn in the field resonates with the way science needs to be taught in the future, that science is a process, that we don't have all the answers. We make discoveries that make us scratch our heads and figure out why did that monkey go across? It did, we don't know how. So, so, so um, the teachers are, at least the superintendents, are observing that the teachers, it's, it's had a, hum, a, a great impact on them in terms of their professional development, but also when they, we, we have them uh, collect fossils and they bring them back to the schools and when they're doing uh, paleontology museums in, in eighth grade earth science at a school called Cesar Chavez Middle School, which serves 95% Latinos, Latinas. Um, and what we're seeing those, if you count, if you want to think about scalability, it's tough to scale thousands of teachers, but if the teachers, in sort of the train the trainer model, the teachers are impacting, we're calculating uh, over a thousand. Um, in the cohorts that we, that the cohorts of 10 teachers every year, they're, they're all, t they're, every year when they go back, they're, in, they're impacting, uh, a th the cohort collectively is impacting a thousand students, a thousand learners. So that's how we scale it. It's tough to scale, you can't, it's expensive to bring, uh, teachers to Panama. It's expensive to, to bring interns to Panama, but there is no substitute for that international experience. And if we're doing it with, 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 inter with university students, we ought to be doing it with STEM teachers. So that's the pitch that I've been making uh, to the National Science Foundation. Dr. McFadden, we have a question towards the back of the room, and due to the time, this will have to be the last question. As you're working in um, Panama, is there any conflict between the rate of excavation for the expansion of the canal and the rate at which you are discovering fossils? Absolutely. We, we can't keep up. We could, have 100, we could have 100 interns working every day, and we could barely keep up. So we're just getting a small portion of what we might get if we had more people down there, but we don't have the resources to do it. It doesn't work like that. <laughs> they, every, you know, every day after a particular date that, that the contractors are not on schedule, they, they have huge penalties. And basically, they, what they say is you can collect in areas that, that are not currently being excavated, but maybe they were excavated a week ago or a month ago, but you have to stay, you, you have to stay away from the excavations. This is a different scale. I mean, we're, we're, um, they're, they're, they're being very gracious to even allow us in there. There are huge um, liability issues, safety issues, and you have to be really careful, uh, security issues. So it's, it's not like that. We're just getting what we can with the group that we have. All right, thank you for the wonderful lecture. <laughs>